interviewing today. It's a great honor. Really happy to meet you uh, virtually. Happy to meet you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, so shall we start? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, I know you don't have very much time, so I'll go straight into the questions today. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, well, we have so, like 40 minutes, so like... 40 minutes? Yeah, <laughs> sure. non-trivial yeah. amount of time. Yeah, please, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, I want to start first with uh, the role of the state and uh, your views uh, on it, um, especially you've mentioned, you've described yourself in the past as a conservative anarchist. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us what that means exactly? Sure. So um, to be a conservative is to honor the traditions, to make sure that we do not sacrifice, for example, in Taiwan, there's more than 20 national languages, each with its own indigenous uh, or immigrant culture. Right. So uh, in the name of progress, we uh, very quickly see that people with kind of solutionism uh, uh, mentality uh, make progress on one axis while sacrificing the other cultures. And so the conservative part means that uh, for the society to agree on a common value is more important than making progress, quote unquote, uh, and sacrificing traditional values held dear by those like more than 20 um, cultures is the transcultural uh, point of view. Uh, the anarchism part, of course, means that we need to go about this change uh, without coercive action, that is to say, without making um, other people obey just simply because, uh, you know, you monopolize the violence or things like that, but rather uh, making sure that people, given the common value that we form by this transcultural view on each other's positions, we innovate to realize those common values together without leaving anyone behind. So that's anarchism, the, uh, free from uh, coercion. So, in this anarchistic world, what's the role of uh, leadership then, especially in a participatory mm -hmm. uh, society mm -hmm. like you? Yeah, it's to, to maximize self-organization, obviously. And uh, so, in, in what way? Can you give us examples? Yeah, of course. So, for example, in this public digital innovation space, uh, everything that uh, I engage in, including this very interview, actually, um, is uh, kept as a either a public transcript or a video recording uh, that's published so that people who lobby uh, would not just lobby to me, but rather lobby to the entire public. And that's also why the lobbies who come here always argue from this global goals, sustainable development, point of view because they know that uh, every other stakeholder will also learn about this lobbying. Uh, and so this become a uh, fundamental beginning of a connection that is more fruitful for self-organization rather than uh, closed door lobbying, which tend to uh, not consider other stakeholder that's missing uh, in the table, on the table. Yeah. You, 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 mentioned, you mentioned in the previous uh, discussion we had uh, that you saw an end to hierarchy. Um, where would leadership be in that sort of like the end of hierarchy? Where where would it actually? What can we? What can it do in that case? Mm -hmm. When there's no more hierarchy? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I mean the internet itself is organized this way, right? We we call internet governance based on the idea of rough consensus, uh, meaning that the editors uh, of the internet protocol drafts uh, really have no coercive power. The internet engineering task force doesn't have an army or a navy. Uh, yet, uh, we are using the internet protocol like right now, uh, and meaning that our telecom providers adhere to this protocol without any coercive action. Um, and that's because those uh, requests for uh, comments, the RFCs, uh, are edited in a way that maximizes self-organization and make sure that all the, not only telecom providers, but the application developers, such as, uh, well, we're using WebEx meetings. Uh, and so pretty much, actually, maybe the router is also manufactured by Cisco <laughs> and, and so on. But, but we do not actually need to be monopolized. If your router is not made by Cisco, but rather by some other vendor, uh, or if I'm joining from, uh, you know, not a WebEx software, but a browser, uh, and the browser is many um, people together uh, who maybe jointly develop this web RTC, the real-time communication, so that whether you're using Firefox or Chrome uh, or the <coughs> Microsoft Edge, oh, well, wait, that's the same as Chrome, but anyway, um, can work together in a way without, you know, one side forcing the other doing any particular thing. So obviously we can do many fruitful things uh, without coercive action because the fact that we're video conferencing now is a testimony to the internet governance and uh, uh, web community. You, you've 
Well, they put a lot of effort and time in the Taiwan, the V Taiwan project uh, mm -hmm. AI mm -hmm. uh, in particular. Can you explain the concept mm -hmm. behind it and how it's actually uh, mm -hmm. working right now? Sure. So at the moment, the V Taiwan platform is um, governed by the social sector. Uh, I have transferred um, like all my um, uh, root account, meaning the the um, control over the machines that host the VTAL and software and so on, um, to the social sector soon as I become the digital minister <coughs> around um, four years ago now. Um, and so I cannot really comment uh, on the VTAL community right now, but far as I understand, they're now working with the parliament, uh, with many members of the parliament, because all the parties in the parliament now have signed on the Open Government Partnership, Open Parliament Network Plan, so that the parliament's workings itself also need to adhere to the Open government principles and the V Taiwan uh, platform is now being used to get this consultation of the rough consensus what people's expectation of what open gov uh, government means in a parliamentary uh, context uh, but when I was still in the social sector and not uh, as the digital minister I work on for example um, the same consultation mechanism by using for example UberX uh, which is a case of people who um, believe uh, in um, algorithmic governance uh, uh, more than the regulations um, argue that uh, because it's more efficient, saves more fuel, saves more time, um, they don't have to um, get a professional driver's license. The machine can uh, basically, through rating system and whatever, um, substitute for a professional driver's license um, that or, or so went the argument uh, in 2015. And there's some um, people who disagree, there's some people who agree uh, by using an AI-powered conversation um, system called Polis, we eventually realized that uh, regardless of people's position, they all have common values around, for example, um, passenger liability insurance, for example, around the, the fair uh, charging uh, plans, for example, uh, the search pricing and so on. The taxis also want to um, use search pricing uh, or uh, additional pricing when uh, the car is uh, specifically designed for specific needs or things like that. Uh, and so we take the consensus tabled uh, the um, ideological differences um, and then made a fair regulation that the taxi fleets and Uber alike uh, can follow the same rules and that was a, a success. Uh, so A AI and the open society is, is what, obviously one direction which, uh, mm -hmm. which Taiwan is, is heading towards but uh, we're seeing around the world that a lot of uh, nations look more inward. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you think that's a temporary trend or, mm -hmm. or is, is that something you are concerned about? Mm -hmm. Uh, by inward, you mean that uh, they care more uh, about using AI for domestic uh, industry or Dom something? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, that's natural, right? Um, so there are social innovation and there is uh, also industrial innovation. Uh, these are like the, the two wings um, in a society, the, the right and the left. Uh, balance one another. Um, and so my main uh, focus is just making sure that whenever there's new social innovation ideas such as distributed ledgers, um, it could be also applied uh, in the industry, for example, uh, when at making a accountable um, uh, like pollution uh, measurements, devices, and so on, if you take distributed ledgers into account or making sure that the mask availability uh, can be audited in real time by people queuing in line and so on. And these are all ideas from the social innovation, but it turned inward uh, to take care of local economic or environmental issues. I, I don't see any problem with that, uh, with this um, open source uh, community um, thinking globally, but acting locally. Mm. But there's also another. Sorry, there's also another trend where people are looking inward and shutting out people from from outside. Mm -hmm. um, possibly they want to see order and security rather than what they foresee mm -hmm. as an anarchic sort of like mm -hmm. chaos. Mm -hmm. um, is that is that something you're seeing mm -hmm. as well around us? Is that something you're concerned? Well, for, for me, um, anarchism uh, doesn't mean bomb throwing uh, like chaos. Uh, for me, it's simply um, maybe if you find that term uh, not that easy to convey, maybe you can say Taoism, uh, which really is the same thing to me as conservative anarchism. Uh, and in Taoism, uh, the main idea is that we build a space, a safe space. Uh, for the various different uh, values to, to mingle with one another uh, without imposing uh, anything, right? That's the, the main idea. So uh, because of this idea, I, I really don't think uh, one need to fear chaos. 
um, as long as one is uh, sufficiently uh, feeling secure and safe uh, in one's um, surroundings, in one's habitat. Now, uh, if one is not safe uh, in their own place, then of course one would be less welcome uh, to uh, other people, right? If I don't have a couch, I probably would not uh, participate in couch surfing communities <laughs> because there's no room uh, in my in my place for people to to surf. Um, and I mean, this is a very simple like human nature in Taiwan. We we bond um, um, exporting of medical masks for quite a few months uh, before we ramped up the production from 2 million a day to more than 20 million medical masks a day. But once we um, uh, reach the sufficient production of masks, then we lift out the bond and may actually donated a lot of masks for humanitarian aid uh, worldwide. But it took us like two months or three uh, to ramp up that production. And before that, I think it's very natural to say uh, we, we don't have sufficient masks for our own use. So uh, sorry about that, but we have to find next work for a while. I, I believe, and you've mentioned it before, that you know transparency is obviously a very a key pillar in your in in anything you do, as far as you know, as far as what the government does, anyway. Um, but there are states right now where where that is not happening. Uh, most recently, uh, of concern being Hong Kong. Um, how are we to see what's happening there, and what is what's your uh, take on on what's if you have one? Uh, on the situation there? Well, Taiwan, of course, through our um, Hong Kong office, um, a office specifically open with a hotline for humanitarian aid. Uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that people who need a safe space, as I mentioned, uh, to n not only be vocal about their ideas um, or continue to run their independent bookstore uh, or um, hold the Oslo Freedom Forum uh, for two years now, uh, and uh, the Reporter Without Borders, um, which has its headquarters here, and so on, um, to make sure that people in Hong Kong can continue to voice freely um, their concerns and their ideas and continue to work with the world uh, without fearing uh, any repercussions. And so um, I still remember when I was a child uh, that was in the 80s, the late 80s, um, Taiwan did not at that time have the freedom of the press. Uh, the martial law was just being lifted and we relied on a lot of international journalists in Hong Kong uh, to report accurately what is happening uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and so I think it's um, time that we return the favor, uh, so to speak. Is there is there a sense in Taiwan that uh, of of more alarm because of, of what's happening right now uh, in Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. Or uh, well, a few things, right? Um, one thing is that uh, of course there was a promise um, of like fifty years. Um, with no change, uh, that uh, that's a literal translation uh, in Hong Kong, and I, I don't think it's fifty years in, uh, yet. Uh, and so, of course, um, I think the so-called one country, two system uh, model, uh, which uh, the idea was Hong Kong is the prototype. Um, I, I don't think that prototype uh, went. Uh, exactly according to the original 97 uh, imagination. Uh, I think it's more like one country, one system now, uh, and specifically the judiciary branch, um, which uh, was kind of the original promise is that uh, the final um, appeal court uh, stays in Hong Kong. Um, I think nowadays people are seeing that that promise uh, is also um, at a heavy discount, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so, yeah, there, there's a cause of alarm because it, it says that uh, whatever the original promise, uh, maybe with the best intentions, uh, was, um, it, it did not develop uh, as it was originally promised, specifically for the judiciary branch. Mm -hmm. do, do you see any hope in the future that transparency will return to mainland China, or, or is this still a very dark cloud that we can't see beyond? Well, um, the experience uh, in Taiwan uh, taught us that, I mean, we suffered the longest martial law in history. <laughs> so so um, we know something about, uh, you know, uh, keeping hope, <laughs> even when all hope seems lost. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think there's a crack in everything. Uh, and, and that's how the light gets in. That's a Leonard Cohen quote. Uh, and I think the important thing here is not to uh, lose hope because of one leader or another leader uh, being captured or being held in prison or being 
uh, investigated or immobilized or slandered or so on, uh, I think the Hong Kong people have told the world the idea of a be water uh, movement in which there can be thousands and thousands of leaders. Each one can be a leader. Uh, there's no limit uh, to what one's imagination um, can, can do and you can uh, actually get people mobilized using hashtags uh, which are strictly speaking actually not leaders because when we think leader we think of a person <laughs> but a, a right hashtag uh, can mobilize even more people than a leader could uh, and so this uh, be water idea uh, from Bruce Lee I believe um, is also a, a very straightforward Taoist idea um, and, and so I think Taoism is uh, what I personally think a, a good uh, thing to keep in mind uh, as do not to lose hope well, I, I think this might be the same for other countries as well. I mean, maybe it's a pandemic, uh, people wanting to see uh, more law and order or whatever, but that seems to be, democracy seems to be in a crisis right now. Um, well, not, see, not in Taiwan, certainly not, not in, in Taiwan. Not in Taiwan, obviously, but in, in, outside mm -hmm. Taiwan mm -hmm. especially. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you see this as a temporary trend or mm -hmm. what changes need to be done in, in general? I'm not talking about a specific country, but in general to democracies. Mm -hmm. but, a, for that to be a, a revival in trust in democracy. Yeah, I think uh, because people feel closer to hashtags uh, than to their uh, candidates, their representatives. Um, so, so that's a real challenge, right? Uh, previously, people feel not specifically closer uh, to representatives, but they feel at least somewhat close uh, to the people who um, you know, do politics, do democracy, uh, the, the voting, um, the referenda in some countries, uh, citizens' assembly, uh, and so on, were the institutions that kept democracy relevant. But nowadays, um, because hashtags literally mobilize more people than most representatives do, uh, and so people feel closer to each other, or at least to each other's hashtags, uh, compared to, to their representatives. Uh, and, and so democracy seems quaint, um, simply because the bandwidth, like you voting three bits uploaded every four years, uh, is simply not enough bit rate uh, for, for most people. And so I think we need to uh, open up day-to-day uh, -day democracy, making sure that people who care about things uh, gets responded in the here and now. And so that's why transparency, uh, while important, I think it's um, just one pillar. The other one is accountability, like uh, the ability for the government to give an account of why we're doing this. Uh, and also, if there's a better idea from the citizenship, then we just immediately amplify that idea into policy uh, as evidenced by our daily CECC press conference, the toll-free number 1922, uh, the pink medical mask, traditional rice cooker to disinfect the mask, uh, whatever. <laughs> all, all these are, are uh, invented by the civil society and then very quickly amplified by the CECC. And to me, this uh, daily expectation uh, of the kind of blended volition um, makes uh, the counter-epidemic um, task force more relevant than pretty much any hashtag. Uh, and in, in which case, the idea that democratization um, is um, somehow a, in a zero-sum game uh, with public health, like you have to sacrifice some democracy uh, and economic activity to counter the pandemic, uh, that um, just um, doesn't hold in Taiwan. Everybody feel that we're actually deepening democracy and uh, re invigorating economy while keeping the pandemic uh, at bay. Uh, and I think this, like, not left-wing, not right-wing, but up-wing uh, thinking is only realizable with transparency and accountability. So, basically, you're, you're saying that there's, well, and I've heard other people say that there's, well, there's a growing, like, digital nation. People, rather than talking about, rather than feeling uh, a feeling of belonging to a certain national tribe, they tend to be more concerned about, say, something online, maybe they have a, a concern that, that transcends yeah, hashtags. Right? Hashtag Taiwan yeah. can help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that's, that you see as a, as a growing trend in the, in the future as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think people who feel uh, alone uh, in their neighborhood no longer feel alone when they find something that they can identify. Uh, and it doesn't have to be purely online. I mean, the hashtag is also a perfect uh, way for me to uh, meet people who are nearby me 
uh, who care about the same thing, and then we can form um, also face-to-face -face relationships. So it's not purely online, but I think online is a great uh, first way for people to get into the state of swift trust, like quickly do something together and then learn more about each other. Whereas previously, before the internet, pretty much people have to know each other before they can work on large-scale projects. So, in a way, because of the internet, the, the world is getting smaller. Um, but at the same time, it's getting, it feels more crowded. People tend to be close, uh, more, di not divided, but they, everybody hears about everybody's opinions mm -hmm, and it's, mm -hmm. it's easier for arguments to start because you hear their, their un, un curated mm -hmm. uh, opinions. Uh, and it's creating, it seems to be creating a lot of, you know, polemic divide amongst people. How, how, mm -hmm. how best to solve that polemic divide problem we're having right now? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think it's just like limit your intake of um, polarized anti-social social media. Uh, and, and that's something that I personally do. I mean, I spend more time in the places without reply buttons uh, so that you can upvote and downvote, but there is no pointless, um, you know, personal attacks and things like that. So all the platforms that we use, Slido, Polis, um, join platform, uh, things like that, don't have a reply button. Uh, and so people would not waste their uh, calories uh, on attacking each other, but would rather spend more time to talk about their common values and ideas. And even when the ideas um, diverge, uh, we can respectfully agree to disagree uh, without uh, name calling, because literally there's no way to do name calling <laughs> on those um, social interaction patterns. So uh, I think whether it's antisocial or pro-social, it's entirely design choice. And uh, one can frequent both, uh, but keep a healthy balance is very important for the mental health. So, do you need? We need. Do you think we need a new social media like platform that has a different algorithm? Is that is that one? Could that be one? Well, very of? very simple, um, like functionality tweaks. Like uh, recently, Twitter uh, made sure that if you start a tweet and somebody reply doing a personal attack. Uh, even though you don't want to respond to it, other people will. Uh, and then the entire thread will be hijacked, so to speak. And Twitter introduced a very simple thing that says, you know, hide this reply from other people. Um, and so that person can still see it. Their friends, if they look for it, still see it. Uh, but uh, you are basically saying that this is not what this um, thread uh, is for. Uh, and, and it's a simple gesture, right? Uh, and we actually um, have this kind of like nonverbal um, signals uh, if you're in a party. For example, if you start talking about something uh, with, with a group of people, if somebody tried to hijack uh, the conversation somewhere, you can just turn to look someplace else, right? Um, like indicating with your body that you don't want to go that way. Uh, but uh, that um, nonverbal behavior was not available on Twitter. Uh, and so it feels like uh, you know everybody can easily hijack any thread, and then they change um, the interaction uh, affordances uh, to make sure that that kind of nonverbal behavior can be signaled online. And, and so uh, I'm not saying that we need to tear down Twitter. I'm saying that um, uh, people more conscious uh, of their interaction patterns and the platform making necessary adjustments uh, that will then make a less antisocial uh, experience for everyone. Mm. This is very interesting. Um, I'd like to also turn now to so like inequalities in 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 basically every nation. <laughs> there, there, mm -hmm. We have inequalities, and and some people I, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Thomas uh, Piketty is uh, his thesis about uh, long term uh, growth of uh, inequalities. Um, first, first of all, obviously he he was mostly writing about 200 years of French history, but um, do, do you see that, um, how, how do you view, and what do you see as the solutions to stop inequalities and to, to, to regain, uh, to, to basically uh, get back more, a more equal society? So, um, I, I, so is this like globally? Because in Taiwan, the Gini index has stayed the same, I think at mm -hmm. least for the past 10 years. So uh, I don't know about growing in class. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, I think globally, there's two things, uh, two, two forces at play, right? <clears throat> One is that inequality was always there, uh, but nowadays with internet, the inequality feels more real. Like you can very 
easily see very transparently uh, in the most um, suffering places. It used to be that they're a distance away, and if you just you know don't tune to the radio or TV channels that covers uh, these places, then you can pretend it doesn't happen. But but nowadays, of course, with social media and um, specifically because of outrage, travels very quickly has a very high R value, so to speak. Uh, people can cannot help but uh, share the. Uh, 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 outrage uh, that is triggered by inequality, and, and this is good. I mean, outrage is a really good um, like highlighter for the society to focus on the problem that are structural and that needs uh, surfacing. I'm just saying that maybe the inequality was, in some areas, was even worse. It was just before the social media, we just simply ignore it. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is okay now that uh, people see that. Um, there are inequalities, sometimes structural, what, what to do. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, the social media sometimes makes people suddenly feel disempowered rather than in the discovery phase, which people feel empowered because everybody can contribute to fact-finding. Because uh, this, the issue seems so large, so structural, um, that nobody can solve it by themselves. Otherwise, it would have been solved by now, right? Um, and so people will strangely feel a, a sense of disempowerment uh, because there seems to be like nothing we can do. Um, and so I, I think um, the way out of this um, is very simply uh, to, to ask a simple question, like what is the, the one habit change, one thing that I can do uh, to make the injustice that I see um, happen less? Uh, and, and so it's back to oneself, but making it a, a social uh, change. Uh, I would, for example, use the ice bucket challenge. As an example, if you do the ice bucket challenge, like um, like spraying very cold water, uh, a, a bucket of ice on one's head, with no filming and with no people nearby, like if you do this alone, it's entirely pointless, right? It, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work at all. <laughs> so the, the whole point of the ice bucket challenge is that you, you make it a social object. So not only uh, one can change one's habits, uh, be more aware uh, in correcting one uh, inequality or injustice, but one need to be very loud about it and also invent new hashtags uh, that then calls uh, for action. And if the call for action uh, can be completed with a couple of minutes, just like Ice Bucket Challenge, uh, and then uh, it, it will also have a high R value. And, and then this time it travels on hope um, and even on solidarity. Uh, and solidarity and the joy that comes from the solidarity uh, actually travels even faster than outrage. I, I think it's the emotion that has consistently a higher R value than outrage. Uh, and so the outrage is the beginning, but this solidarity and joy uh, in participation uh, in behavior change together, uh, that's the, the um, outcome. And, and I think that's the really the thing to do if one, one want to uh, systemically reduce inequality. Rather than doing this alone, one would then start movements. Mm. Do you have any examples uh, of that in Taiwan, for mm -hmm. example? I know, I know mm -hmm. you've got a very diverse uh, mm -hmm. culture. You've mm -hmm. got, obviously, uh, the indigenous people. You've got uh, mm -hmm. islanders and, and, mm -hmm. and I suppose, mm -hmm. I don't know the term in English, I think, but there's a term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's like people originally from the mainland as well. Um, mm -hmm. ha, I'm sure it was mm -hmm. quite diverse mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, how did mm -hmm. you? And it probably st and it still is. Well, yeah, uh, with more than get, more than twenty <laughs> national languages. In fact, yes. So how, how do you mm -hmm. get all these together not to, so like, uh, to be become more equal to listen to each other then? Yeah, I, I think this is uh, about uh, the transculturalism uh, idea that I mentioned. To be transcultural is to be open to other cultures' interpretation of your own original culture. Um, and I think that really is the key. Um, like in the indigenous nation of uh, Taiwan, um, the uh, leadership is doesn't really uh, work uh, with any gender stereotype, right? So, so no matter which gender you are, um, you, you can be a leader. Uh, or in the Amis, uh, which is a, a matriarchy. Uh, and, and so on. So, so there's many different social configurations coexisting um, in Taiwan. And so our LGBTIQ plus uh, um, community don't need to look far uh, to other social configurations and models without getting trapped uh, into any specific culture, any specific um, vision. Uh, and so I think uh, that uh, really inspires people 
uh, to make sure that uh, people do not get uh, whatever uh, their first culture does not limit their imagination uh, of what the society can be. Uh, so that's, I think, the, the important thing. And the other important thing uh, that you asked about uh, whether you know people with very different background, why do they not, um, and I paraphrase, um, just um, attack each other, right? Uh, I think uh, it, it's important to, to note that uh, no matter where uh, we are in Taiwan, we're actually physically quite close, even though it's 23 million people. From the northmost to the southmost by high-speed rails, it's just one hour and a half. So um, even though it's very high density, um, geologically, it feels like a larger municipality. And, and this is important because then people feel that we're in the same polity together. There is no simple us versus them if us and them is just one hour and a half apart. Um, and, and that also helps. And so uh, why broadband is a human right is so important. It's just to connect the most rural, the most remote indigenous um, places uh, together so that people can feel that we are in the same island uh, nevertheless. So in a way, it seems and I, I was talking to some of my colleagues earlier, it just seems Taiwan is, was lucky to have so many diverse cultures. Uh, what, what kind of advice can you then give to, and if you can, uh, to a culture that is or believes itself to be just one monolithic culture? Is there is there a way out of that? It can, is mm -hmm. there, how can they become transcultural <laughs> in mm -hmm. a sense? Yeah, um, I think a few things. Um, like in Taiwan, um, when we did marriage equality, Many other nearby, um, like East Asian uh, cultures, said that. I mean, that they, it, it's unimaginable to to them. Uh, and and I said, you know, if you look into uh, the the people who campaign for the equality for the uh, LGBTIQ community in terms of marriage, they they actually honor marriage, right? They have to feel that marriage means something. Uh, otherwise, they would not campaign for that um, particular mm -hmm. right uh, to be first uh, to uh, consider inequality. And, and so actually they have much more in common when it comes to family values and so on um, than any pretty much any other coach <laughs> who, who doesn't quite care about marriage. Uh, and so that's something that we can have a conversation about. And so through the two referenda, the Taiwanese people decided uh, that when two individuals wed, that's the subject for uh, equality. But when the two families wed, that's just pertaining some particular cultures. And these cultures uh, think that people uh, who are same-sex um, newlyweds do not automatically wed their uh, families according to their family culture. Uh, and, and that's fine. So uh, when we legalize marriage equality, we say we legalize the bylaws, but not the in-laws. Um, so their families do not form in-law relationships. Now, and so even though uh, you talk about a monoculture, I'm sure that across different places, across different generations, across people in different disciplines and so on, there's bound to be things like this, where we care about the same thing, but we care about it from different angles. So if we can innovate and find a way that are um, open to the interpretation from all the different positions, while realizing the common values that we hold dear, that's uh, something that we can all live with. And this is more important than the monolithic like this is something that's perfect, right? If uh, you seek perfection, then of course it's almost automatically excluding people who are different. But if you only seek rough consensus, that's to say uh, we can live with it, then it's not quite consensus, it's more like consent. Uh, and, and that uh, will include more people and you, you will uh, gradually become more transcultural. Hmm. So, I mean, there's obviously Diversity in in the sense of of cultural diversity, but sometimes there's you know, economic <laughs> diversity. Some people are not as as well off as, as others, and I should, I'm sure uh, we were talking about uh, economic inequalities earlier. But how how do we flat? How do we go to? I mean, what's the best way to to give individuals the opportunity to 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 rise above and 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 so I flatten the the inequalities in that sense. In, it, in, 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 many, in, in, in many countries, in many countries, getting a COVID test is less expensive get, than uh, going to see a doctor. But in Taiwan, it's the other way around. Going to see a doctor, going to a clinic, is less expensive than getting a COVID test. 
and, and so uh, it, it's very interesting how in Taiwan the healthcare, the single payer universal health uh, care system covers not only citizens but also residents. Anyone who stay for more than half a year gets into the NHI system. And the NHI system is pure socialism. Like um, people don't have to worry uh, about getting sick. Um, and, and this is very important because then it enabled when we encountered a pandemic people to feel that there's a safety net there and they would not suffer neither financial nor social pressure if they develop COVID-like symptoms. And so they would just collect a mask using their NHI card and go to a nearby clinic. And in that way, we make sure that people all participate uh, in the uh, public health uh, as a responsible citizen. Uh, and, and this uh, single payer system, um, the kind of pinnacle of socialism uh, in Taiwan is just seen as something that's at us every day. That's something that people um, are very acquainted with in the past 15 years or more. Uh, and the same goes for education. Uh, and uh, K-12 education all the way um, is um, like uh, free of charge. Uh, and people can choose their own national language, their own curriculum, even uh, if they're experimental education people, up to one tenth of the population, but still covered uh, by the state's um, budget uh, when it comes to education. So there are things like this that make sure that if you are economically even less well off, uh, you can try again and again without worrying about your children's education or your old parents' um, health care. And, and that um, makes the opportunity uh, more equal. So, so I'm, uh, my, one of my usual saying is that in Taiwan, when you swipe your NHI card, you're in socialism. <laughs> and when you swipe your credit card, you're in capitalism. And both systems coexist in Taiwan as a social democracy. What do you think of the, the basic income or the universal income uh, mm -hmm. idea? I, mean, I know that there have been some uh, tests, and I believe it was in Finland um, and mm -hmm. other places, but mm -hmm. and they've not been very conclusive. But it, do, do you have a position on that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the thing is that in, in the Social Innovation Lab, which is here, uh, we hold many uh, UBI uh, conversations. Uh, one of the UBI uh, Taiwan's, I think, uh, core member uh, was a staff here in the Social Innovation Lab. So in the spirit of social innovation, of course, we run like international conferences on UBI and things like that. The, the thing with Taiwan, though, is that UBI tend to uh, get political support uh, when there's a pressing problem that cannot be solved any other way in the country. So whether it's like rampant uh, mass unemployment uh, or whether it's structural, huge, growing inequality, or pretty much anything else, then UBI will be lauded as one of the possible solutions. The, the thing is that Taiwan has no pressing problem like that. Uh, and so UBI remains a, a really good idea. There's board games, there's people who spread that idea, advocates, researchers who uh, help on the economic models, but we mostly uh, work with other jurisdictions, other economies outside Taiwan who are, are more pressing in introducing UBI to gauge efficacy. So we're happy to contribute our research capability. This is similar to, uh, I guess, COVID management <laughs> because we're, we're less uh, pressed uh, for uh, the, the treatment in our uh, research and development in the medicinal uh, sector. We have more uh, capacity to share with the world. So, I mean, it, on a global scale, as I mentioned earlier, the world is getting smaller, uh, and especially in industrial nations, they're also getting older. Competition is on the rise for limited material resources uh, and limited intangible resources such as labor. Um, how should nations navigate their way in such competitive times? Uh, and can we continue to compete for these resources, especially by destroying, uh, destroying them at the same time? I'm not sure that labor is bounded and finite. Uh, I mean, if you have industrial robots, uh, can, <laughs> human labor. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that there's there's uh, so much difference between human labor and robotic labor, though. Um, I, I mean, I, I simply don't think that there's a limited labor resource uh, in mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, most human labor, if it's repetitive and it can be uh, described in simple structures, uh, could be automated and is now being automated, actually, um, uh, across the board. Uh, and so um, automation, I think, uh, shows us that even for um, resources that we consider uh, scarce, um, 
like the GPT-3 model, can now uh, complete a, a theor theoretical play if you give them uh, the first scene and a few um, stanza, then it completes the rest, right? Um, and, and so even cognitive resources uh, like um, the, the one that I just mentioned uh, can now uh, be helped by assistive uh, automation. Um, and so I, I really don't think uh, either in cognitive labor or in physical labor there is only uh, bounded resources. That's not uh, what I'm seeing. Um, so in, in that case, is there, is there com I think that a lot of people are worried that AI robotics will replace human labor as well. Uh, what, what, why, why is that a bad thing? Again? It's not necessarily a bad thing, but mm -hmm. I think people are worried about it. Um, I think because their skills uh, are probably not going to be updated fast, mm -hmm. as fast as a robot. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what, well, then you can sit back and relax. What yeah. skills do you think are, are necessary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, you can sit back and relax, right? Uh, or, or you can go hike a mountain. There's a lot of beautiful mountains in Taiwan. Uh, and, and even I know some robots that can hike a mountain very quickly, much better than I do. I would not dispatch them to hike a mountain, take a photo, and go back to me because what matters in hiking is the enjoyment uh, of the of the the flow, right? The flow of the the hiking trail, and of course we will not automate that because that would defeat the purpose of uh, interaction and enjoyment and creating uh, a common good, right? Uh, but if it's just about you know getting to the top of mountain to make sure that the um, I don't know the telecom station, uh, the five G tower is still operating, then of course I'll fly a drone there because I'm not enjoying the <laughs> climbing um, experience. I'm just wanting to get something repaired. And so uh, I think it all depends on our values. If uh, we value as I mentioned uh, autonomy, interaction, and the common good, uh, then all the AIs are just assistive intelligence. They need to be value aligned to us and be accountable. But if we uh, over identify with particular skill sets, then of course there is cause to worry. But I don't identify with any skill set, so I, I don't worry. Hmm. Well, what do you tell young, the younger generation? Uh, what, what kind of well, skill sets or mm -hmm. what, what they should know and mm -hmm. how they should basically face the future. What, what's your message to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just, just lifelong learning, right? Keep learning um, and uh, making sure that there is uh, that a support network uh, of people who learn together, uh, who create together. Uh, and the mindset is, uh, to me, much more than any skill set. Mm. Well, what, so, and how did... Then how do you get older people who probably are less, uh, some, not always, but some of them are less flexible about it? How do, how do you get them to change their, their mindsets? To then that then, kind of then you still mindset? learn, but, but slightly slower. Then, right? Isn't <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone learns their, at their own pace. Um, I, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody have to learn equally quickly. I'm saying that learning at one's own pace. Uh, I mean, it's the same as hiking, right? It's not a competition. The, the point is to, um, to enjoy the journey. Uh, and if you do enjoy the journey, um, then actually racing to the top in the case of hiking may not actually be, be the best choice because uh, one would exhaust oneself. Uh, and so the, the point is that be realistic um, in what one can realistically learn in one's lifetime, uh, contribute what you have learned uh, as much as possible. Uh, and if there's something that's just not um, your cup of tea, then then maybe some other person can learn it and you can work together. That's collaboration. Are, are there any particular things we need to learn for the future or is this just everything, anything in general? Yeah, I Yeah, the mentality to keep, keep learning because um, it used to be that there's uh, like standardized answers, but with each innovation, the standardized answers don't work anymore. <laughs> you have to uh, work with a, a different reality. And so I think just clearing one's cache right, in, in one's brain, uh, in one's mind uh, is important because the reality is constantly being updated. And I mean, it's always like that uh, since the beginning of time, uh, of human history at least. But I think in recent um, years, uh, what used to be like uh, standardized answers in the industrial area, which is uh, actually a very short time span in the human civilization, um, is now being challenged so that we have to go back uh, to pre-industrial times to be essentially um, just lifelong learners uh, instead of a uh, specialized skilled person uh, that need to fit like a cog in a machine. I, I mean, all these metaphors 
and is not even 500 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot one question. Uh, we, we, we briefly uh, talked about earlier the uh, econom you know, economic in inequalities, and obviously uh, every country is different, and you probably are not that uh, aware of the latest in, in say, Japan. Uh, but are there any lessons in Taiwan's uh, or commonalities in Taiwan's, uh, you know, how they dealt or how they're dealing with the economic inequalities that could be a lesson for Japan? Yeah, I think we agree uh, with Japan that the uh, like longevity uh, of human beings is not a drawback, but rather a uh, cognitive resource um, to the entire society. Uh, the fact that there are many people who uh, past the traditional retired age still very much willing to contribute to the society uh, if we uh, do the universal design well. Uh, I think it's a golden opportunity in Taiwan. They are called the, the golden age, the golden era. <laughs> so literally a golden uh, opportunity. Uh, and so uh, intergenerational solidarity uh, is very important. Uh, and there's also a strong um, idea in, in Japan that AI is there to assist uh, the people who are closest to the pain, who are suffering, um, and uh, the like universal access uh, to those um, help uh, is necessary not only in the largest municipality, but also in the most rural places. I see uh, Japan's Society 5.0 uh, plan. I think we're very much value aligned on this particular regard. Mm. Um, obviously, an older generation is is a generation that needs to be more uh, still be working and active, and especially I think in Japan they talk about uh, now life being um, up to a hundred or maybe even right. further than that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, retiring at sixty five no longer seems mm -hmm. um, very. Logical. I well, I retired when I was thirty-three, so you know, uh, well. I, I, I have no place to come in. <laughs> have you really retired, though? <laughs> yeah, I, I work uh, just for fun, then, uh, and and also uh, for public benefits. The the main thing is that I. Uh, would then associate only with like voluntary associations, the social sector, so to speak. Uh, and I think um, that's a trend, right? For people who uh, start a new enterprise uh, after they retire, they often choose a association, a co-op, a not-for-profit organization. And because uh, they already played that game, particular linear economy game, you know, went pretty good at it. And so they cease to feel uh, satisfaction when it's just about linear competition. And so uh, they work on, I guess, wisdom, <laughs> not just intelligence, uh, when it comes to uh, the economic um, interactions. And I, I mean, if people retire at 65 and live all the way to 100 or so, um, there's still plenty of time, like 30 years of time, to work on a more wise uh, interaction mm -hmm. uh, in terms of organization. Obviously, if we live that long, we have to be healthy as well. We just that's that's yeah, the course. other problem, isn't of it? Course. Yeah, yeah, but but that's also something AI can help, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, basically, how how do we? You know, you talked earlier about bilingualism in in Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Taiwan twenty thirty yes. uh, bilingual country project. Uh, which is fascinating and, and, mm -hmm. and super interesting. Um, but I want to go a bit, a bit more into detail. Um, I, you, you've already, you talk about, you talked about it not just being English or, and, and Mandarin. Yeah, it could be an indigenous language and mm -hmm. then English. Yeah. So how, how do you make that work for countries that have only one, con uh, one language, for example? Or technically, have only one language. I mean, would it just be English? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. Well, it could, it could be English and JavaScript, right? And JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, this is uh, too general a question. Each country, of course, have, have a very different configuration. But the point here is uh, just to make sure that one is open. Uh, to international mm -hmm. collaboration and exchange. That's the most important thing. And JavaScript, of course, is also a popular uh, language when it comes to international mm. exchange. So in Japan, you may, I'm sure you're aware that they, they do learn English from an earlier, uh, early time, and it's still a bit of a struggle here. Um, how, what kind of advice would you have for Japan then to, to get beyond uh, their current um, level of, or to, get, to become more bilingual? 
Well, I think uh, in Taiwan, we're, we're intentionally inviting more international people to be also Taiwanese, like getting a gold card and staying here, right? So, so they're, they're Taiwanese, right? They may have dual citizenship and so on, uh, but they don't have, uh, you know, the indigenous or Mandarin or Holok or Hakka as their native language. They speak some uh, other international language. Mm -hmm. And the more diverse the composition of the population, the more natural it would be uh, for other people to start interacting. And, and there's really no other way around. Uh, mm -hmm. So just diversify uh, one's own population. I think that's a, a really um, a, a, a no-brainer, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and then beginning from that, you will see different culture to start buzzing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a big, uh, you know, that be more important makes it more important to educate people, either whether it's language or mentality or whatnot. Um, you, you put a lot of effort in in, in educational reform, but how, how much weight should we put on educating reform compared to other reforms? Do you think it's top priority? How, how do you? See? I think it supports uh, pretty much any other reform, right? Because in Taiwan, the education reform that started with the um, Experimental Education Act, uh, or even before that, it's basically saying that people who believe the society should be reformed in such a way can start their own schools uh, and their own curriculum um, as if uh, that is the highest priority. <laughs> so, so it then leads uh, to teachers and children who uh, study under very different cultures and uh, without this kind of officially mandated uh, culture. So it increases the, um, both the resilience um, in, in terms of the idea scape, right? So when the society changes, the, the people who uh, have already prepared for it um, uh, can be the most resilient bunch, but it also increases dialogue uh, when it comes to possibilities uh, in the educational system. And then when the social reform comes, um, I think the people who participated in uh, the ed early re education reform, um, principals can now say, oh, you just go to look at that system or that system. They have people who are talented who can then respond to this uh, social change, to this social reform. So I think it's just diversifying the educational landscape uh, prepares a society to whatever social reform that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. And going back again to your, um, you know, foreigners can come into, overseas people can come into Taiwan and become Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. uh, w what does that make, basically, in, in, that, in that case, what is a nationality for you? What, what does it mean to be a certain nationality? Does it change the meaning of, of being Taiwanese or... Mm -hmm. Well, I think being being Taiwanese is just to be open, transcultural, uh, to transcultural innovation. Uh, it's just a mentality, a, a mind, uh, mindset, right? Uh, there, there's really, of course, the national health insurance uh, is there, uh, and the uh, universal education, broadband as human rights. Uh, if you you think these are good ideas, then then you can also be a Taiwanese. Mm. So, and you don't have any pushback in Taiwan. I know in Japan, there's it's a bit more the, the national identity is is far. Uh, how how would you put it? Uh, more conservative, I suppose. A traditional um, is is there is there any pushback in Taiwan, or is it, how how did you manage to go beyond uh, beyond the traditional confounds of? Of nationality or uh, well, or if you start with a plurality of twenty national languages, adding one doesn't sound mm. so many. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> right. So, so it, it's uh, it's. I, I wouldn't say that uh, you know you you can very easily copy what Taiwan does. I, I'm not saying that. Though. I'm just saying that uh, to me personally, nationality is something. Um, that I don't over identify with. Uh, I, I don't really think I, uh, like it's a useful abstraction most of the time. Uh, and if it's not useful uh, in any particular regard, for example, when we're having this conversation, time zone definitely is more important than nationality. Uh, and so <laughs> I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah. Mm. Well, we've got we've got about two minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, basically, are there any questions you want to ask us in, in return? Um, mm -hmm. Any, any uh, thoughts you had uh, mm -hmm. as final messages, as a final message, basically? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I would like to know uh, when you publish this. Can we publish the video or just the transcript? Okay. Um, I think Hajime-san could. I know it's going to be published a bit later, but um, I don't have the details for that. Mm -hmm. Hajime-san, do you have? So, um, we, we are still in the process of um, coming up with mm -hmm. that. 
the um, the deadline okay. of the pub publishment. Okay. So okay. So just, just let me know later. Yeah, it's fine. I, I can embargo the publication on my side until you do. Uh, and if you decide to do a video, just send me a video. If you don't, uh, we can have an audio recording. I can make a transcript. Just let me know. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And Hi. live long and prosper. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <you>. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.